welcome back. We are now going to continue our dive into the subject of geometric algebra, this diversion away from QED prerequisites, but uh, it's certainly entertaining and uh, I'm really enjoying my time going through this material. The space-time algebra as a powerful tool for electromagnetism is the vehicle by which we're learning this subject. And uh, this paper gets better and better every time I read it. I really, really enjoy the paper. And the space-time algebra, by the way, is abbreviated often as STA, which is one particular geometric algebra. And we have made a lot of progress, and we are about to begin reading this paper's uh, discussion of multivectors. We have done some background and we have done some preparatory work uh, regarding multivectors, so this section should be quite uh, accessible to us now. And after a little bit of review and errata, let's uh, begin section 3.3. I think I need to get used to doing errata in this material because it is not nearly as familiar to me as uh, other mathematical physics material, more classic mathematical physics material. And uh, so I'm just going to have an errata section in front of every lecture. And thankfully, there are those watching this series who understand this material pretty well, and they are happy to point out my errors, obvious and less so. In this case, it was actually kind of an obvious mistake. So I did discuss this... Uh, um, this, the notion of a direct sum, right? And the, the structure I used was, oh, we're going to take two vector spaces, combine them to create a third vector space. And you can definitely do that. However, if you, if you study most linear algebra texts, it usually posits everything the other way. It says, hey, given a vector space, we want to ask, is it the direct sum of two of its subspaces? Or given two subspaces of a <clears throat> vector space, is the uh, vector space the direct sum of these two subspaces? And essentially, if this, it's equivalent to say, if this original larger vector space can be constructed the way I have described it in the last lesson, then the answer is yes. But what's very different about those two approaches is if you think of V and W already as subspaces of Z, then you know one thing very important. The scalars of V and the scalars of W are, in fact, the same as the scalars for Z. And if you look at the way I wrote it down when I spoke about it, I said, oh, V has some field F1 and W has some field F2. And then I kind of glossed over the fact that Z obviously has a field. But it is important to understand uh, this bottom-up approach doesn't demand, the way I wrote it, that all these fields be the same field, right? And that is important for all of this work, the, the, the two vector spaces that you direct sum together, for our work, need to have the same field. I don't know if there's some exotic way of taking two vector spaces and creating a direct sum if they have different scalar fields, but obviously if you're going to uh, you know, scale a vector in Z, and it's presumably this kind of sum, that scaling factor has to flow through both sums. So these subscripts that I wrote here really shouldn't be here. They should all be the same field. And you know what? I should have even been simpler because all of our work, all of our work is there's only one field that matters, and that's the real numbers. This process of a direct sum is truly more mathematically general, but for everything that we do in the space-time algebra, and indeed everything we do in the geometric algebra, it's real numbers. It's not, this isn't even, the fact that real numbers are, the scalars for all the relevant vector spaces is a fact that's true for geometric algebra. Okay, so that's an errata. Uh, there was one other errata or errata-like thing. Okay, regarding this. So we have what well, we we described a multivector, and I wrote down this notation for each of the grades of the multivector. And this multivector can be considered the sum of grades. And I won't bother anymore talking about this sum. We've covered that. Everything we said was correct. You know, this is some, you know, in a formal way, this is some quintuplet, ordered quintuplet, right? And this is, this is, this grade, the zero grade is always the scalar grade, the vector grade, the bivector grade, the trivector grade, the quad vector grade. And in principle, for any, for arbitrary geometric algebras, this can go up 
much lar larger, and it terminates all depending on the dimensionality of, of the, uh, the grade one vector space. So that, this is, this, as far as I know, this is universal language. If I take a multi-vector M and I want to talk about the grade two part, I throw it in brackets and drop down a little bit of a two. So that's universal. What's not universal is this. And I'm using A and B as bivectors for this demonstration, right? So a bivector product will have a scalar part, a bivector part, and a quad vector part. Uh, bivector part, not a vector part. See, I've already made a mistake. There you go. I made an errata in the errata. How about that? So the question is, is how do you write down, using just the two bivectors, how do you make a sensible notation for the scalar part? And there's universal agreement that the largest part, the uh, quad vector part, is just given by A uh, wedge B, right? That's, as far as I've seen that in every single paper, that's the case. The problem is with this scalar part. And I've picked up whisperings of a debate. I haven't read all of, of Hestenes' work, but apparently he made the claim that you can't really create a simple object just using the bivector nature of A and B and create a scalar. You have to break A and B down into their vector pieces. And then I think somebody out there contradict that and say, no, no, you can actually do this. You just have to use the double dot product of, of, of tensor calculus or of tensor analysis. And it does seem to me like that double dot product does make sense. But on the other hand, it also seems like when you actually execute the double dot product, you are kind of going into the guts of the vector structure of A and B. So I'm not going to really worry about it, but those that like the double dot product do use this notation, but I think that might only be one person. <laughs> um, but I like it, so I'm going to stick with it, um, and I offer it up. The mechanism we showed in the last lesson about how to do it is more important, obviously, than the notation. Um, but most, uh, most papers do, in fact, use just this single dot product with with uh, the dot either in the bottom, depending on the type setting, or in the middle. And this is leaning on the fact that the dot product between two objects, well, the mechanism of calculating it and the things on both sides might, the things that it's dot producting might vary, but we expect it to be a scalar. And this is always a scalar, right? And then uh, there's, I, but I have seen even more of a uh, fluctuation in what goes in here, right? If, for example, in this notation, the dot product suddenly is just the thing that returns this, the grade two's part. Here's the literal language of the grade two part. And this, I think, actually showed up in one of Hestenis' papers, I, although I can't find it right away. And he has some connection between, you know, he, he prefers this notion of this commutator bracket. I, not to, uh, we're not going to, deal with this notation that much. We're pretty much going to stick with this because this is nice and universal. Okay, so, uh, or, although we might use this part here for the highest grade piece. Okay, so with those two errata in place, uh, let's do a little review. We have made our first pass at the complete picture of C13, and we understand it to be the direct sum of four uh, vector spaces. And we've given all the vector spaces a name, grade 0, grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, and grade 4. That's the sort of mathy name. And then by language, we call these the scalars. I should write down the language names. So we have scalars, vectors, bivectors, pseudovectors, and the pseudoscalars. And dimensionality 1, 4, 6, 4, and 1. And we've given them, I, I've kind of leaned into the names I, I'm familiar with from uh, exterior algebra, these lambdas. And we understand that this, of course, is a Minkowski, uh, this is a inner product space, four-dimensional inner product space with a Minkowski inner product. And there you have it. So we are, and we understand how to do this space-time multiplication, right? We can take any multi-vector M, 
and we can multiply it by any multivector n, and we uh, we know how to do that now because because we've learned how to do in the space time algebra at least all of the multiplications of the different blades, the different simple simple members of each of these uh, grades. And by the way, when you can do this, uh, just to be clear, this algebra, when it, the algebra has this structure, it's called a graded algebra. And the graded algebra means you can break it up into these grades exactly as I've described here. Okay, so that is what the multivector world is, and now we will turn to the paper and read how they present it. So section 3.3, .3, multivectors, let's begin. By iteratively appending all objects generated by the wedge product to the initial vector space M13, we construct the full space-time algebra C13. So that's exactly what we've done. Uh, that sentence needs no more explanation because we have spent two lessons on explaining it, or more than that. Uh, we have appended, right? That's the way this worked. Is we, they created this product, and they said, well, to be an algebra, it's going to have to be bigger. It's going to have to be bigger. And the question is, would it, would it, there is some issue, like, if you do that and you create this sort of mathematical product, the space-time product, I mean, in principle, it could have been that, you know, you take A and you take B and you produce something of a different nature, D, and then you take A... And then you take uh, uh, a and multiply a and multiply by d, and then you get, you know, something completely different again, right? And then this process never ends, right? And you can never close the algebra. I mean, that could have happened. It could have happened that appending things wouldn't have generated anything at all, but in this case, it does. And that's the way math, as a natural subject, constrains itself. You find these things that actually close and say, like, oh, well, if it closed, it's a thing. It must be interesting. And if it doesn't close and it's some infinite thing, well, you have to ask yourself, can you get your head around this infinite thing? And it's just this really interesting way that mathematicians explore the universe, right? They, they just look for this kind of stuff. And they, they noticed, hey, look, that we appended and we created an algebra, which was closed. Anyway, to go on, this notation indicates that the space-time algebra is a Clifford algebra generated from the metric signature plus, minus, minus, minus. So what's important about that is kind of what I said before, is once you build this algebra, this guy here is sort of a center stage, in my opinion, right? It's a center stage. I'm sure that in some abstract view, anything here could be considered as the centered stage. In fact, Usually they talk about making, once you decide on the pseudo pseudoscalar, uh, that's what you need because the pseudoscalar decides the handedness for the whole algebra. But to me, this metric is the most important thing. And they're saying this, this particular grade one vector space comes with the metric that tells us this is a space-time algebra. It has to be that metric. Could, could have been other metrics here, and you would have gotten other mathematical objects that would have been interesting for other reasons. But for our reasoning, you really need this metric signature. And the fact that it's a Clifford algebra is, I think, this particular product, this, the product of the algebra is what makes this thing a Clifford algebra. But regardless, they're calling it a Clifford algebra. Importantly, all components in this Clifford algebra are purely real. We will not need any ad hoc addition of a complex scalar field in what follows. Okay, so this is a bit of a, a dig, right? <laughs> so first of all, when they say all components in the Clifford algebra are purely real, it's important to understand what they mean there uh, because components, you know, if, if you read this loosely, you might think, oh, all the parts that make up the Clifford algebra. But I'm quite sure that's not what they mean. What they mean, of course, are the literal components, right? If you have a multivector m, it's got some scalar, right, uh, s, and then it's got some vector, a mu gamma mu, and then it's got some bivector, f alpha beta mu alpha wedge mu beta. Uh, I think I'm going to start throwing these over twos here until I know differently. 
What they're saying is that this number, these numbers here, those are all elements of the reals, right? All of the components, the components of each of the grades that make up any multivector, those components are real numbers. Now, the reason this is a dig is because you certainly can have vector spaces with complex components, right? Quantum mechanics lives and breathes on vector spaces where these numbers here would be complex. Of course, these would be bras and kets, and there's a whole different architecture and how, the, how it's done. But the point is complex vector spaces are completely legit, completely fine, and they're used to great power in uh, branches of physics. <laughs> but what they say is, oh, no, no, complex scalar fields, those are ad hoc. And when you see ad hoc, right, when you see someone calling something ad hoc, that is a dig, right? That is an unambiguous dig, which is fine. I mean, that's, that's sort of the whole point. But what they're saying is all of a sudden you have a theory that suddenly has complex numbers in it. And in order for your theory to work, you've got to have complex numbers and complex numbers are bad for what reason? Not completely clear, but what is clear, and I'm going to sort of restructure this. I'm now, I'm now putting words in the mouth of the advocates for geometric algebra, so I need to be cautious. There is a certain notion of, hey, let's keep it simple, stupid, right? And if we keep it simple, well, why would we... Well, certainly we think of reals is simpler than the complex numbers. If for, if for no other reason, then the dimensionalities of the reals is one and the dimensionality of the complex numbers is two. So if I can build up an entire algebra out of one-dimensional objects and have all the benefits of doing the thing, of having the thing constructed out of two-dimensional objects, well, shouldn't I do that? And I think that's, that's probably what they're getting at here, is you don't need complex numbers if you use geometric algebra. So any use of complex numbers is, is ad hoc relative to something more fundamental that, and that's a completely real algebra. And when I say a real algebra, we're talking about real components. Okay, so that takes care of this little paragraph. And moving on, the the repeated wedge products produce five linearly independent subspaces of the total algebra known as grades, which are illustrated in figure two. Each grade is a distinct type of directed number. I'm not going to expose figure two quite yet because I want you to see how this paragraph already matches our own, what I'll call version of figure two, right? Which is this thing here, right? One, two, one, two, three, four, five grades, right? Just like they're saying. Um, the real scalars, the pure numbers, are grade 0, while the four vectors, line segments, are grade 1. So notice that they're throwing in the name of the grade, right? They're, this is the, the, they're identifying the grade, uh, they're giving it a name, and then they're giving it an interpretation, right? So four vectors, the name, line segments, the interpretation, in M13 are grade 1. By vectors, plane segments, here's the symbolism, are grade two. Successive wet products produce tri vectors, which are pseudo vectors, or three volume segments, they're little volumes of grade three, and quad vectors, which are known to be going to be known as pseudo scalars, which are four volume segments, and they're expressed this way, and they're grade four. And that completes the algebra. We refer to the elements of grade K subspace as K blades. I talked about that in the last class. And what follows to disambiguate them from grade one vectors, right? They don't want, they, uh, they don't want to use the word vector all over the place, right? Although they probably will continue to use bivector. Um, but they might be using two blades in this paper. I can't, I can't really remember. But the point is, is using the word vector all over the place becomes a bit of a net mess. We want the vector to just represent these guys right here. Four vector, line segments, members of M13. So we're going to get rid of the word bivector, trivector, quadvector, and uh, we're going to call them all 
two blades, three blades, four blades, even though they probably should be two vectors, three vectors, and four vectors. You know, the more I, I think about it, the more I like their use of the word blade here. Okay, moving on. For concreteness, we systematically generate a complete graded basis for C13 as all independent products of the vectors uh, gamma sub mu from mu equals 0 to 3 in a chosen basis of M13. Okay, very rich and important concept right here. For concreteness, so I think what the, the, the I think that is a euphemism for we're going to use basis vectors. We're not going to do our entire work using writing things like u wedge w. We're going to do things using a chosen basis set. And I suspect that's what they mean by concreteness. Um, so whether or not doing it in a certain basis is concrete or not is, well, that's, I guess, I, you know, I, yeah, I think that, I, I think it's fair to say that if you do things with the basis vectors, you're kind of fixing yourself to uh, some particular frame of reference. But what's interesting is when you do this, you know, we're not specifying much particularity, um, you know, what this basis actually is. It's, you know, you know, where in the world it is, what it's modeling. Obviously, if we switch bases, we're, we're going to switch to some sort of prime basis from prime to unprime. But the, the, the point is, is if we do that, the only thing that's meaningful is the, the relationship between the prime and the unprimed basis, right? So, um, so like this relationship becomes what's important. But the point is we're going to do everything in basis vectors is what they're saying here. But we're going to generate a complete graded basis. Notice they use the word graded basis. And what they're trying to say there using our own charts is, well, these are the basis vectors for M13, but look, the basis vectors for this section is are these um, bivectors. So you take these basis vectors, form all the bivectors, and or all the linearly independent bivectors out of them, and that becomes the basis for grade two. You form the trivectors. These are now uh, so, so this is in a different grade, right? You have these grade one basis vectors, grade two basis vectors, grade three and grade four basis vectors. That's what they mean by the notion of a graded basis. So that's pretty simple. Um, and they're all the independent products of the vectors uh, uh, gamma. So that in a chosen basis of M13, again, showing that this is sort of our fundamental space here, this M13. But what's important is this notion, independent products of the vectors. So when they say products, the only thing they can mean is space-time product. So what are we, how are we to understand this? So let's, uh, let's take a moment and, and step aside. Well, actually, let's finish the paragraph, and then we'll come back to this idea of the independent product. We choose the starting vector basis to be orthonormal, right? So we've already done this. So orthonormal in the sense of Minkowski. Oops, they, always, they say that. In the sense of Minkowski metric. So gamma... 0 squared is 1, gamma j2 is minus 1 for j equals 1, 2, 3. So let's take a look at that, because when we write gamma 0 squared, we're talking about the space-time product, right? Not the Minkowski dot product, right? There's a good chance that if you read this, you know, and you just jumped in the middle of this paper, you would somehow think that, you would somehow think that this statement here, right, is meant to mean gamma mu, whoops, is meant to mean, let me write it here where it's clear, gamma zero dot gamma zero, right? But it's not. It's meant to mean gamma zero, gamma zero, where this is a space-time product, and this is just the grade zero part of a space-time product, or the fully symmetric piece of the space-time product, um, which, uh, uh, so we have, to, we have to clear up exactly what they mean there, these, these, these products, these independent products. Um, and then they finally say at the end, the choice of notation of the basis is motivated by a deep connection to the Dirac gamma matrices that we'll clarify in section 3.8. As I said, that they're, they're choosing gamma 
because of this Dirac gamma matrix connection, which is so interesting. Okay, so let's uh, unpack this a little bit. So we start with the space-time product of two of our basis vectors of M13. So we know the rule for that. When you're multiplying space-time product two vectors, two members of M13, two four vectors, right? When we do that space-time product, this is the rule. We have this dot product part and this wedge product part. We know this is a scalar, and we know this is a bivector. Now, gamma mu and gamma nu are normal vectors. They're, they are, they're, they're, they're basis vectors, sure, but they are elements of M13, and they obey this rule like any two other vectors in M13, just like when we write, whoops, when we write A, B, we get A dot B plus A wedge B. So that's the first thing to understand is just because they're basis vectors doesn't mean they don't apply the rules. The point is, is that when they are basis vectors, the rules get a little bit simpler because we have already chosen the fact that the, the dot product between gamma mu and gamma nu is already known to be uh, eta mu nu, which means gamma zero dot gamma zero equals one, gamma one dot gamma one equals negative one, and so on. So we know what these dot products are. We also know that the, that, uh, that the space-time product of gamma zero with itself has got to be a real number. So we know right away that this goes to zero when mu equals nu. We've already demonstrated this. And that's true for all of these, gamma one squared, gamma two squared, and gamma three squared, where now we're talking about these squares as the space-time product squares, right? gamma 3, gamma 3. And this affords us the ability to simplify things quite a bit. So the first simplification we make is that the space-time, well, it's, it's this, which is gamma 0 squared, equals 1, equals negative 1, equals negative 1, equals negative 1. So that's the first thing we can say. When we're dealing with these orthogonal basis vectors, the space-time product of well, this is the space-time square of any one of these basis vectors is either 1 or minus 1, depending on whether it's a space-like basis vector or if it's the time-like basis vector. 0, I'll probably call the, I'll try to call it the time-like basis vector, and these are space-like basis vectors. So right away, we know that this rule simplifies greatly for the case where mu equals nu. But it also simplifies for the case when mu does not equal nu, because in that case, when, when we have gamma mu gamma, whoops, gamma nu, where mu does not equal nu, right, that is, uh, well, the dot product is zero, right? The dot product is zero, which means this term goes away, and this is the only surviving term. So we know we can write gamma 0, gamma 1, we know that that's just a shorthand way now of writing gamma 0 wedge gamma 1. Gamma 0, gamma 2 is gamma 0 wedge gamma 2. And we get all of these by vectors just by multiplying the basis vectors as a space-time product. So this becomes a shorthand when we want to talk about the bivector 0, 1, we just write the space-time product of gamma 0 and gamma 1. We want to write the bivector basis vector gamma 1 ga wedge gamma 3, we just write gamma 1 gamma 3 because we know that we have a particularly simple circumstance where this uh, dot product term goes away because of the metric we have chosen. Right? Because of this metric, this simplification is possible. And likewise, we, uh, so the two simplifications are these bivectors are all written as space-time products, and these squares immediately reduce to real numbers um, uh, 
based on the metric, based on whether they're space time, space like or uh, uh, time like. And all of the basis vectors can be form formulated this way. Gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two is going to be gamma zero wedge gamma one wedge gamma two. Right, this triple space time product. And that can be easily seen because we know this is associative, so I write gamma one gamma two, which is gamma zero uh, gamma zero which equals gamma zero space-time product with a bivector. But we know how to take the space-time product of a vector with a bivector. Remember the rule. This is the one where this guy, where this, the, the, where this vector gets projected into the plane of this vector and then rotated 90 degrees. That's the, that's the vector part because this whole thing has to break into a vector part and a tri-vector part. Well, the vector part is gamma zero's projection into the plane of gamma one, gamma two in two different ways. But gamma zero doesn't have a projection in the gamma one, gamma two plane, right? It's orthogonal to that little piece of plane. It's a different basis vector, right? In other words, gamma zero dot gamma one, uh, gamma, uh, wait a minute, I think that's backwards. I think it's backwards. It goes like this. Gamma zero got dot gamma two gamma one minus gamma zero dot gamma one gamma two, right? Well, that's zero and that's zero. So the vector part of this product is zero, which just leaves the tri-vector part, wedge gamma two. So this is now shorthand for this. And likewise, for the pseudoscalar, this is the shorthand for the pseudoscalar. Now, we've made a choice about the pseudoscalar, right? Because there's only one pseudoscalar out there. And so by listing it time-like on the left, and then one, two, three, we've chosen <clears throat> essentially the handedness. Because remember, if you interchange any two, the sign of this should change. So we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the pseudoscalar. But the point is, is these space-time products, right, are now going to be these blades, these two blades, three blades, or four blades, or one blades, or zero blades, <laughs> right? These space-time products is a very simple way of writing them down as long as you're using the basis vectors of the Clifford algebra. All right, and continuing with their writing, the basis of zero blades is the real number one. The basis of one blades is the chosen set of four orthonormal vectors, gamma mu themselves. Um, then the bivector basis is gamma mu, gamma nu, when mu does not equal nu, and they point out that there's only six of those. <clears throat> and then, but notice how they do the notation here. Now they they just introduce a notation, well, I guess they introduce it right here with this triple equal sign. The triple equal sign usually reads, in case you're unfamiliar with it, uh, and this is my own interpretation. Triple equal means is defined to be, right? So what we're saying here is that the space-time product, gamma mu, gamma nu, well, that equals gamma mu wedge gamma nu. And that equality is a real equality in the sense that it's a calculation. You have to know that gamma mu dot gamma nu equals zero if mu does not equal nu, right? With that fact that orthonormality fact in, in place, you can write this down. But this is too much writing. That's too much writing. Even that's too much writing. The paper says, let's just go right down to the brass tacks, gamma mu nu. Let's just give it two subscripts scripts, and declare it to be anti-symmetric in those indices and call it good. So now, <laughs> when we go back to the work that we had done over here, this could be written, uh, well, let's start with the bivectors, right? This could just be written as gamma 0, 1, gamma 0, 2, gamma 0, 3, gamma uh, 1, 2, etc., right? And this guy here could be gamma 0, 1, 2, 3, right? That's what that is. And likewise, this is gamma 0, 1, 2, right? So we're really compressing the notation. But in order to do this, we have to lean on the fact 
that these guys are basis vectors in M13 in our Minkowski space, and they satisfy the Minkowski metric. Otherwise, you can't do this, right? So this is one of the strengths of choosing a basis and doing everything with basis vectors, is you can write everything in terms of space-time products, and you're still going to be correct, right? Because, you know, this is not... This is a blade. This is a two-blade. It is not a multi-vector with a scalar part because of the nature of gamma 1 and gamma 3 and gamma 2 and gamma 0. So continuing on, they give us this notation, right? This excellent notation, which we're now going to use. Due to the symmetry, uh, due to the anti-symmetry of the wedge product, well, that's just this last piece. These independent elements form the oriented basis of two blades. It's oriented, of course, because if we chose, since we're choosing this to have uh, you know, we're choosing gamma. Well, I guess what they've done here is is these bivectors uh, are independent. Gamma 1, 0, gamma 2, 0, gamma 3, 0, 1, 2, 2, 3, and 3, 1. Notice how those are backwards from the ones I chose. I just noticed that. So I went with gamma uh, 0, 1, right? They're saying, nope, our basis vector is gamma 1, 0. So I went with uh, gamma 2, 3, and they, they also went with gamma 2, 3. And I went with gamma 1, 3, but they went with gamma 3, 1. <clears throat> so their, um, their bivectors basis is not the same as the one that I've been laying down. And the reason I lay it down my way is I'm used to this notion of increasing indices, right, where the indices uh, are constantly, must go, must go up for the basis vectors. So, um, but they don't, and um, uh, we'll flush out the reason for that a little bit later, but it doesn't really matter, right? As long as you choose it, you're good to go. So they've chosen these to be the basis vector. Um, the product of orthogonal vectors with bivectors, meaning these three, are the, is this triple product. Well, I, I've already done that, right? And they went with one, two, three, one, two, zero, 2, 3, 0, and 3, 1, 0. Notice these are not the same that I would have chosen, right? I would have gone with, I would have agreed with 1, 2, 3, right? And I would have disagreed with 1, 2, 0, and I would have gone with gamma uh, 0, 1, 2, which, by the way, uh, isn't even a sign flip difference, right? That's just, yeah, that's because 0 moves over twice. So, that, so it's really the same. It's the same. Uh, it doesn't even have a sign flip difference. Um, uh, 2, 3, 0 does not have a sign flip difference either, but uh, I think um, 1, 2, and then 1. This one does have a sign flip difference, right? So the, the paper is choosing uh, the basis vectors differently, but as I said, that's, that's, uh, that's just, there is a, there's, there's inevitably going to be a good reason for that. Um, but they form the oriented basis of three blades. And here, actually, it is truly a blade, right? The basis vectors are blades under every definition of the word blade, because every basis vector is clearly written as A wedge B wedge C, right? So this would be gamma mu wedge gamma nu wedge gamma delta, right? And that's clearly how blades are defined. Finally, the product of all four orthogonal vectors produces only a single independent element, and that's this guy, right? And it's only a single independent element, meaning it's, it's the basis of the quadra vectors, or four blades, as the paper calls it. It's defined this way. Um, it has no scalar, or, well, I, I guess in this case it would have, you know, if you multiplied it by a bivector, you would expect a a a bivector and quad vector. If you multiplied it by a trivector, you would expect a vector and uh, a tr another trivector. And if you multiplied it by a single vector, you would expect a uh, trivector. And if you multiplied it by itself, you would expect a scalar. So, um, uh, Uh, I'm not sure why I said that. 
it's sort of irrelevant, right? The point is it's one dimensional is what they're trying to say. And they choose the, the classic gamma zero, one, two, three. Um, you're going to see why they made these other choices in a moment, um, or eventually. Um, that serves as the basis for the four blades. Hence, there are 16 independent basis elements for the space-time algebra partitioned into five grades um, of four choose K. This is just a way of counting how many are in each grade. Uh, independent basis K blades. Okay, so now let's go to their figure. And s now we know all of the things we need to know to understand their figure number two. So now I want you to appreciate how much beautifully simple figure number two is compared to my thing, right? And the reason I've, I've done it this way is this is sort of the under the hood stuff. And I want you to appreciate the value of the notation, right? The notation they've chosen really compresses everything that I've written before, makes it much sweeter and more convenient to see. And they're not even done, right? This is their first step. It's even going to get simpler than this. But my, my sense is, is understanding geometric algebra, one of the problems which is typical for all um, uh, studying of new mathematics, is the notation itself can become a little bit bizarre if it's made too convenient too quick because you kind of lose connectivity to the core nature of things. That's why I kind of harped on the plus. Now, this may be totally a me problem, right? This may be my hang-up, and I'm now forcing it on you. <laughs> um, but the truth is, is if you get too simple too fast while you're learning something new, it's... It, I guess in some way it gets you to the mechanics of things quicker. And someplace people would argue, well, you're, you're, you're actually concealing all of the complexity, which is good for the new learner. I, I just don't work that way. But of course, on the other hand, I'm very slow to learn. So I don't know. Anyway, here we are. <laughs> um, but I, hopefully, if, if everything's gone according to plan, this now looks like a very beautiful simplification of things. Each grade is now described in this vertical axis. The bottom has one dimension. It's the scalars of grade one. The first rung of our grade ladder is the key basis vectors. They're basis vectors. So we got a name. We got a geometry, a geometric interpretation. And then we see we have um, all of the bivectors, right? Now, you'll notice they, they, they've split the bivectors into two pieces here, which we'll, they didn't mention yet, but they will in a second. Um, so we'll talk about that. And then you have the, uh, the trivectors are here with their special. Now notice they, they, they're committed. They have committed to this ordering as their basis vectors. So their basis vectors are gamma 1 wedge, gamma 2 wedge, gamma 3, and gamma 2 wedge, gamma 3 wedge, gamma 0, and gamma 3 wedge, gamma 1, wedge, gamma 0. You'll notice the 0 is on the end when they can do it, right? When there is a 0. So that is uh, something to take note of, and we'll see why. Notice here, the gamma 0 is on the, the right also. So they've committed to the basis for the, for the grade 2 part. They've committed to the basis gamma 1, wedge, gamma 0, and gamma 3, wedge, gamma 0, for example, right? So they've committed to that, which is very different than my picture, where I committed to a more natural basis if you're coming from the subject of exterior algebra, where this is very typical. You always have this increasing index. But they've chosen to give that up here, and they have a reason for it, and you'll see that reason later. But again, it doesn't really matter I mean, it, it's, well, it, it matters in the sense that it creates a better notational architecture, an arithmetic arch architecture, algebraic architecture, I suppose, is the way to say it. Um, and you can kind of see where this is coming from, right? You've already seen right here that they split the basis vectors, or the basis bivectors into two parts. This is purely space-like, right, meaning... All the indices here are greater than zero. These guys have a time component, so I'll just call them time-like until the paper changes the language, if it does. 
And you'll see, so the distinction, they, they color these red and they color these blue, right? And you can even see that here. Um, you can see that right here, hold on. Um, in, the, in the basis vectors as well, the time-like one is blue and the spake-like one are red. They've added this color dimension to things. Uh, and they've, they've given this one a, a blue appearance. So understanding that color dimension of things is actually pretty interesting. Also, the tri-vectors are colored blue for time-like if they have the zero in it, right? So what's interesting is the, uh, you know, the, the time-like tri-vectors are the majority of the basis vectors for grade three, but the time-like vectors are the minority for the basis vectors of grade one, right? And these, there's dualities between these things, right? Uh, there's a duality we're going to learn about between vectors and trivectors. The bivectors are self-dual, so the dualities kind of kind of look like this. And uh, there's a duality between the scalars and the pseudoscalars that we'll all learn about. And they take advantage of all of these dualities in this study. And then, of course, they use this notation, which is sort of universal, a general, a general multivector is the sum of, is this, uh, this sum of, of, of parts of each of the different grades. And now we understand how sums work. So those are the multivectors. Okay. Um, let's read this text. I'm trying to make the text as big as I can, because I know it's going to be really hard to read. So I'll, I'll just read it out loud though. The graded basis for the space-time algebra is C13. So they're talking about this as the graded basis, right? Because each basis vector lives in its own grade. But as a whole, these guys here are the basis vectors of the vector space of C13. Each multivector decomposes into a sum of distinct and independent grades. We understand that. That's what this line here says, this, this square right here, which can be extracted as grade projections MK. So each of these guys... Um, each of these pieces they're calling a grade projection. A grade projection is the word they're using. So this, this you can almost think of those bra angle brackets with the subscripted number as an operator that projects from M onto the, um, the grade two basis, for example. Um, let's see, grade projection. The oriented basis elements of this of grade one, that's these guys uh, here, these base vectors, are an orthonormal basis, and that, so they emphasize the Minkowski nature of those things, um, for the Minkowski four vectors of M13. We've talked about that a lot. An oriented basis element of grade K, such as gamma mu nu, and they show this, it's defined as gamma mu space-time product gamma nu, which, because of the Minkowski nature, is just this bivector. So this is synonymous with this bivector, but it was only synonymous because the space-time product, due to the orthogonality, uh, reduces to this bivector. It's a nice convenience here. Uh, they talk about the anti-symmetry is constructed as the product of k of these orthonormal k uh, four vectors. Interchanging indices permutes the wedge products, which only changes the sign of the basis el element. Hence, only the independent basis elements of each grade are shown. Right. Fair enough. We. We've understand that obviously, for example, gamma three two is not independent of gamma two three, so it's not on this list. The color coding indicates the signature of each element, with blue being a plus one and red being minus one. So the signature, right? Remember, uh, the idea is, if you take a space time product of 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 a vector with itself, right, gamma zero squared, you end up with uh, a signature times the absolute value of eta um, gamma zero gamma zero, right? Like that. And uh, this eta is the signature, right? So the magnitudes of these guys uh, are, is that is, that's a good point. I don't think they mentioned that yet, how to calculate the magnitude of all of these other things, right? Like what's the magnitude of A wedge B, right? I don't think they've defined that principle yet. But uh, there is such a thing as the magnitude of A wedge B, and that magnitude 
uh, there will be a signature in front of that, right? And so you can, we can anticipate that these signatures are going to be um, uh, blue is positive and red is negative, right? So it, it looks pretty clear to me that the, uh, this figure is a little bit ahead of, or the, the caption of the figure is a little bit ahead of the text. So where the text refers to the figure, right, right here, if you read the caption, the caption is ahead of where these references are, which is fine. I mean, I like captions that have a lot of explanation in it because I know I can come back to it. And it's a little bit of uh, foreshadowing, right? The color coding indicates the signature of the basis elements, so I know, oh, gee, I, I better understand how magnitudes are calculated. The boxes and shading indicate useful dualities of the algebra. So they're saying the boxes and the shading. So I didn't notice the boxes. So what they're saying there is there, there's actually a variety of dualities here. And um, one set of the dualities is the box duality. So all of these guys, right, have a duality with all of those guys. But in addition to that, there's also dualities between the shaded stuff, right? And that's what I was saying before. The, the two shaded things are dual, and this one in the middle is self-dual. So there's two kinds of dualities depicted in that picture. These, this dotted line to solid line duality and the uh, uh, shaded... The, uh, un the shaded to shaded and unshaded to unshaded. Now, the, the notion of being dual is really an interesting mathematical idea. Um, there's a lot of different places where this word duality comes in in math. Um, in exterior algebra, it's Hodge duality. So they say the solid and dash bodges are Hodge dual under right multiplication of the pseudoscalar. And they're going to talk about that in section 3.5, which is well ahead of us. Well, within each box, the shaded region is dual to the unshaded region, right? Uh, within each box, the shaded region is dual to the unshaded region under right mul multiplication by the time light basis vector gamma zero. So basically in this caption, they've really defined all of the dualities. And they've also pointed out that I mislabeled the duality when I made it simpler. That is, when I said this, the, what, what they want to say is that um, uh, they say these guys are these guys. They're related by Hodge duality, where if I take an element out of this and I call it A and I do right multiplication by the pseudoscalar, I guess that would be with gamma... 0, 1, 2, 3, then I turn it into uh, something in this box down here. And that's duality by right multiplication by the pseudoscalar. And then they're talking about another form of duality within each box. It's by multiplication by gamma 0. So if I take, if I take these guys here, multiply on the right by gamma 0, I get these guys here. So that's the duality. It goes like that. Obviously, if I take that guy by gamma zero, I get one, right? So I, get, I have that duality there. Likewise, up here, if uh, uh, I multiply these guys on the right by gamma zero, I get these guys. And if I multiply this guy on the right by gamma zero, then, hmm, then wouldn't I get minus? Wouldn't I get minus gamma zero, one, two, three? Well, we'll flush this out more in, in section, uh, um, we'll set, flush this out when we get to the appropriate section. But there's a little foreshadowing to be done here, and that's fine by me. We're not, we're not going to explain these dualities right now, but we're going to allude to them to get your mind primed for when we actually study them. But anyway, great picture, and you, the point is, is what you should be taking away right now is understanding how these subs this notation is constructed how it relates to the wedge product and how it relates to the basis structure that we outlined here, right? And then you kind of forget this and you live entirely in their world, in the world of the paper, which is a much simpler and more pleasant place. And it makes these, and, and it's designed so that these dualities are easy to see. And you'll see how important they are as we go through this paper. Okay, so where are we?
So we're at this paragraph here, and they're about to introduce the, the importance of the pseudoscalar and a little more notation. And I think that can wait for next time. So we've made some progress in our paper, and we're just going to keep plugging forward and try to capture what these dualities are all about and how their notation works, and uh, we'll carry on next time.